Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to our service this morning. We trust you've come ready to receive from the Lord today. And uh, I hear we have a birthday on today. And uh, this young man is turning six years old, I think, today. Is that right? Happy birthday, William. Now, William, you're going to have to come and get it, buddy. We have a balloon for you this morning. Let's sing happy birthday to William, all right? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, 
Before you sit down, greet someone and let them know that you're loved by God. I'm loved by God this morning. I'm loved by God. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. Bless the gifts this morning for your kingdom. Amen. time. So I'd like for uh, Bob and Sue Sharp and Ted to come and join me at the front. <laughs> All right. So uh, each uh, year we have a time when we welcome new members uh, into our uh, fellowship of believers. And uh, it's always a good time of uh, fellowship to do that together. And uh, we look forward to this time. And so this morning, you'll see a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we have a yellow rose that everyone will be given this morning. And uh, those yellow roses represent uh, friendship. So a part of being a, a part of a family, church family, is also being a friend to this church family. So uh, as we give you those roses this morning, that just reminds our new members that uh, you're a friend of this family. And uh, so we're glad for that this morning. Uh, they will also be given a certificate of membership, which is a part of, uh, they can do whatever they want with it. They can hang it on the wall, they can, they can tuck it in a file, but anyway, it acknowledges that they uh, have officially um, met the requirements of becoming a member of this uh, church here, this local body. And uh, then we also have the opportunity as a, as a church body to welcome them this morning, and uh, we'll give you that opportunity. But uh, first thing we do is we're going to share just, I'm going to ask some questions, and uh, they will respond in unison together. And uh, this just <coughs> solidifies the covenant of membership. Okay, so. <coughs> Beloved in the Lord, you have been baptized into Christ and come now to be received into membership into this congregation of the Free Methodist Church. We rejoice with you in all God's mercies that have been brought you to this hour, and we join our prayers with yours as you make this sacred undertaking. 
Do you have the assurance that God has forgiven your sins through faith in Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe the Bible is God's written word, uniquely inspired by the Holy Spirit, and do you accept its authority for what you must believe and how you must live your life? I do. And do you hereby resolve by God's grace to be Christ-like in heart and life, opening yourself fully to the cleansing and the empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the scriptures, and the nurture and the fellowship of this church family? God has help, I do. Do you accept the articles of religion, the membership covenant, the goals for Christian conduct, and the government of the Free Methodist Church of Canada, and will you endeavor to live in harmony with them? Trusting God's help, I do. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, will you embrace the mission of the Free Methodist Church within and beyond this congregation, and will you join us in giving sacrificially of your time, talents, and resources to help us carry out that mission? With God's help, I will. I will offer you the right hand of fellowship. I welcome you to the Free Methodist Church and specifically to the Belleville Free Methodist Church. And may you experience the membership in this body that it enriches your life and the life of this church family. And may your contribution to its life strengthen both you and all of us together. Amen. So Sue, I welcome you <laughs> into the Belleville Centennial Free Methodist Church. shake their hands and give them a quick hug. Can we do that? <laughs> Not everybody at once. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> right over here, Karen's going to lead the way. And let's, we're not, we're not going to spend all morning here, but we're going to walk them. Come on, come on, come on. This is a church family. We want them to know they're welcome. <laughs> If you're not comfortable coming up, that's fine. I just know that there's something that will be a good welcome here. Notice that your bulletin is a little bit 
stuck this morning, but let me just uh, draw a couple of things out of it. First of all, you should have a sheet in there that talks about how to pray for the Free Monthly Church Conference. So uh, that uh, is this week. It starts on Thursday. Uh, Les Young and myself will be going as representatives of the church, and we're hoping our good wives will be able to join us and be with us as well. We'll see how that all works out. But uh, we are glad to uh, be able to represent the church. So be praying for us. That just gives you some things to be praying about. And uh, so every day we would appreciate your prayers this week. Uh, on our table, there is the new uh, Becoming a House of Prayer a monthly update that's on the table. Some of you, uh, they just lay there. We encourage you to pick them up uh, and uh, take them home. Uh, also, you'll notice in your bulletin this morning, be a prayer warrior. Uh, we're looking for people to be a part of our prayer chain at the church and uh, be able to be contacted and and pray for certain needs that come up. I think that was used twice this week. And uh, so uh, be thinking about that. If you'd like to be a part of that, uh, fill that out, put it in the plate. Uh, also, you'll notice this morning we have someone, a couple, celebrating 40 years of marriage. And uh, so we're uh, thankful for uh, uh, Bill and Robin. And if you can be a part of that uh, activity this Saturday, invite you to be a part of that. And uh, Celebrate with them. So those are the uh, announcements I'm going to draw your attention to that are in the bulletin. Uh, we do have a couple of videos. Uh, the first video is, again, uh, the mission seed video that we've been showing from the Peterson family. And uh, so we have another one to show this morning. And then also uh, we're going to show a Brian Dirksen promotional video. Uh, Brian Dirksen uh, is going to be coming to this uh, area, Maranatha Church, on June the 16th. And uh, he is one of the uh, main writers of some of the uh, courses back in the 90s, I think it was. And uh, so anyway, uh, we will be host, uh, there will be a concert in Belleville on June, and it is a free concert. Uh, not have to pay for any tickets. Uh, it's being underwritten by a number of people who are contributing to the concert, so it's open, completely open to the public and whoever wants to come. And uh, if you would like to make a donation towards that, uh, you can talk to me about it. It can be made to BCM, the Belva Ministerial uh, Christian Ministerial Group in the city here, or it can be dropped in our own offering plate here and it can be passed to them. Uh, as a part of our ministry the community here. So uh, this will be similar to uh, the last spring when we had a church-wide worship fellowship uh, back in, what was it, January this year we had one. Uh, so it'll be similar to that, at, uh, except that it'll be a full concert and uh, it'll be a time of worshiping together. All right, Tim. When God called us into orphan ministry, um, to be honest with you, we really thought it would end up in somewhere in Central America. After all, taking eight people to somewhere way across the world um, didn't seem very logical. And But that door didn't open, and the door that began to open was Africa. And I, I had to give it to God. I had looked up the price of plane tickets. I mean, if we went to Central America, $350. If we went to Africa, over $1,000 or $1,200 per ticket. And I had to give that to God and say, God, okay, I'm trusting you. But I did. I did question God. And I said, God, are you sure? Are you sure this is where we're to go? HIM is doing a, a series right now of emails that go out and praying for harvest workers. And the one that I got yesterday, um, I really liked. I'm going to quote something that Dr. Randall McElwain wrote in a short article in that email. He says, let's begin with a quiz. True or false? Missionaries are fearless spiritual heroes who are never tempted and who never become discouraged. The correct answer is false. Yes, missionaries are my heroes, but they are not supermen. I identify with this, and he's absolutely right. 
There are times that we get discouraged. After God had clearly opened the door for us to work in Africa, we began traveling. and We had been on the road for about six months, raising our support. Uh, to be honest with you, we were tired. And there was a small window for us to take a break on the calendar. And we thought we were going to have a weekend off. And then we were asked to go somewhere. And um, we had never been to this area before. Uh, if you're from Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, or Florida, a lot of people know us. but. Um, we were going to a different location. We didn't know anyone here, and they didn't know us. While we were on the road traveling, Misty asked the question, why are we even going here? We don't know anybody. We've been traveling, like I said, for six months, and most of our personal support had been coming in pretty well. We had also raised our support for the vehicle that we needed to purchase, but there was one area where we struggled with. We needed to raise about $8,000. Uh, for our plane tickets to come to Africa. And to be honest with you, hardly any of that money had come in. We did our services that weekend and God helped us in our services. At the end of one of those services, I had a gentleman come up to me and he gave me a piece of paper and he had his phone number on it. He said, give me a call tomorrow. The next day we had scheduled to go to a homeschool convention to buy some school supplies for our children as we were preparing to come to Africa. And I said, why don't you go into the convention and let me call this gentleman and then I'll be in in a minute. I called him and he said, Brother Peterson, he said, I feel like I should go ahead and pay the rest of what you need for your airplane tickets to go to Africa. He said, let me know what the amount is and I'll send in a check. You know, I think many times in our life, we get a little frustrated because God doesn't answer in our time frame. But when we can look back at when God answers our prayers, we realize that the timing was absolutely perfect. It's what we needed. We were discouraged. We had been on the road for a long time. But that weekend, God gave us a boost and encouragement. This became one of our faith-building moments that became a faith-building monument that we can look back on and give God the glory. Tanya, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, has 
is experiencing the beginning of liver failure and she was uh, admitted back into the KU Medical Center on Friday night and she also now has a septic infection as well and there's just uh, a lot of trouble going on physically with her. But uh, our greatest concern is her spiritual need and uh, we appreciate uh, those of you that have joined us in uh, lifting her before the throne of grace. Uh, God alone is the one that can reveal himself to her in a way that she can't say no to. And uh, so let's remember her in prayer this morning. We appreciate that prayer. This is my brother's daughter um, and uh, would appreciate that. It's also, as I mentioned earlier, remember the conference that's coming up this week and uh, be praying for that as well. All right, worship team, uh, come and join me. We do have an item of praise this morning. Uh, the updated amount for our mortgage pay down is $19,960. Isn't that awesome? So thank you everyone that has contributed to that and, and that window is not completely closed. I mean, you can, uh, if you have not had the opportunity or taken that opportunity to uh, put some money towards that pay down of mortgage, then we welcome you to do that and uh, we'll make sure it gets to the right place. So thank you again. Uh, God is faithful in what he does. All right, let's uh, join together. <laughs>
recognizing that you're our friend, recognizing that you are one that we love today, recognizing that you first loved us so that we might in turn love you this morning. And as we pause as a body of believers today, we come with uh, needs this morning. We think of those that are in hospital. We think of Cliff Newlove. We think of uh, Betty Warburton. We pray, Father, you'll be close to them, be with their families this morning. Father, we pray for Tanya today. We ask that you would visit her room of, of illness today, and Lord, that you would speak to her spiritual heart this morning. Father, we think of Elaine's mom, and we pray that you would minister to her needs today and continue to give the strength that's needed there. Father, we think of uh, the unspoken request that would be a part of our body here this morning. We lift them up to you today. Uh, those that we carry burdens for as we come into this place. And Father, we pray that you be with uh, Bob and Cindy this morning, that you'll continue to walk with them, Father, in their journey today. And may they sense and, 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 uh, and know your presence close by, Father, we pray. We ask this morning that you remember our countries today, remember Canada and the U.S. And uh, Father, we pray again that you will uh, come uh, to help us come to a place where we'll bow our knee to you once again as countries. And we pray for the world itself and, and the, uh, many of the conflicts that are happening all around the world this morning. We pray for a, a powerful intervention of God and, and Father that you would uh, work in these situations today. Now, Father, we just commit this service to you. Thank you for who you are, and help us, Lord, to serve you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated, and uh, Roy Seenberg is going to come and is going to sing a number and song for us today. This old hymn that I'm going to sing this morning, entitled, I'm Near Home. Lately, I've been thinking about, could be because of my age, I've been thinking about circumstances and people in my life who encouraged me to come into the Lord in the first place and then to grow up in the Lord. And I did have the wonderful advantage to grow up in the church, so I had it in my head. And I, and I think I had a, quite a good understanding, but it was only in my head. And so I think back of my family, uh, people I knew. Uh, I think about my General Motors days. I trusted the Lord Jesus when I was 27. I, I think that's about 55 years ago, I think. And I, I, I was thinking about some of the guys that I worked with that encouraged me in the Lord. And last July, I went out to Walkerton to visit my sister for 10 days. And I did intend to stop in Whitby. And I did stop, but I went to the church and, and met the pastor. And uh, not talking about us, my wife and I becoming believers and about some of the people we knew. And interesting, I mentioned a young lady who was a teen bopper back then. And he said, well, she works in the office. She's here now. <laughs> and I had the wonderful privilege to see her and remember those days. And to think about, as I said, some of the guys at General Motors that were a wonderful word of encouragement to me coming into the Lord Jesus. Rick Grunveld, who was a real good friend of mine, and he was a part of the Christian Reformed Evangelical Church in Whitby. And another gentleman, I can't even remember his last name, Hank, lived just north of Whitby, always shared a word of testimony that encouraged me along. Stan Naylor, who was a part of the family of the King Street Pentecostal Church. And uh, sometimes I would go to him, I, I now know, to hear a word of encouragement for me to come in the Lord Jesus. He never failed me.
never fail. He would share something about the Lord. I appreciate that so much. And when I was out in July visiting my sister, I had an intention to stop in Whitby and Oshawa, not just to stop at the church, but to see if I could hunt those guys up and say thank you, but I didn't have the time. I'm thinking about doing that, going up to Whitby and, and if they're still around to say thank you. Also, I had another gentleman who encouraged me. I, I've always had a little bit of stubbornness, but it's healthy, positive stubbornness. <laughs> and I had a young fellow that I worked with that he would tease me about my believing in the Lord Jesus. And sometimes you'd laugh about it, and sometimes you'd get a little bit nasty about it. The last day that I worked at General Motors, I had to go to, to Bill, and I said, Bill, I appreciate your friendship, and I, I appreciate so much that you bugged me the way you did, because you encouraged me even more in the Lord Jesus. And we enjoyed a wonderful handshake together and a good, healthy laugh. I've never seen him say it. <laughs> but just thinking about our walk with the Lord, so I'm nearer home. I walk with God through all the years, through flame and flood. Through pain and tears, I'll follow him, his voice obey, I'm nearer home than I was yesterday. I'm nearer home than I 
comprehensible God. In other words, this little finite mind that has been put inside my skull cannot figure out God. If it could, he wouldn't be God. And so, yes, he's blessed us with uh, a lot of, of uh, truth and intelligence, but my finite human brain cannot completely grasp this God that we call our God. He's an all-knowing, all-wise God. Uh, yes, he is smarter than our smartphones this morning. So no matter what you ask that smartphone and if it gives you the right answer or wants to know who you are, uh, the God that we serve is the God that knows everything all the time, uh, full knowledge of everything that has been and, and will be uh, and has ever been. So he's an all-knowing, all-wise God. Last week, we shared a little bit about he's an omnipresent God. In other words, he's fully present everywhere. Uh, this uh, last Wednesday, when I was speaking at chapel, I, uh, I was reminded about his omnipresence. And, and I just I thought, you know, what's the, what's the population of our world today? And if you look at it uh, back, I don't know, it's maybe been three years ago or so, it was... It was getting close to the 8 billion uh, uh, population of the world. And so now we're probably a little bit 8 plus billion uh, people in the world. And oh, just, the, just the, the fact that he's fully present with every single individual of that 8 plus billion at the same time. No wonder my little finite life is blown away a little bit. I have trouble being present 
<laughs> I'll just end it there. <laughs> but this morning, we're going to visit one more truth. And uh, the God of the Bible is a God that is the glorious God. The glorious God. And as I prepare this message, uh, again, I struggle with the words to describe a glorious God. And so may the Lord help us today to just get a little glimpse of his true glory. Amen. Amen. So let's ask him to help us. Father, we realize today that we need your help to understand who you are in our life. And as we walk through some of this truth about your glory, um, Lord, give us an opportunity to just for a, a few moments time to just grasp some of that glory this morning. And I know that that can only happen as your spirit works in our lives. And so we just pause and, and give you permission to work in my heart this morning, work with my lips today, work with my mind that we might be able just to catch a glimpse of your glory this morning. Amen. Our writer says we long to see and experience something that's great and majestic. Something that, that's beyond the ordinary. Something of significance and worth. We are naturally hungry for glory. We are attracted to glory. We seek it. Think about the world today. Think about some of the entertainers that are on the top charts of the singing and the and the sports and the various places that that there, there appears to be glory at. And think of how it's sought after. The glory we seek, though, is a fading glory of the world. But we want to spend time this morning about a glory that only belongs to God himself, the God of the Bible. Our writer goes on and asks just a couple of questions. What will I lack in my Christian life if I fail to grasp this truth about God? In what ways will I be, be diminished in my discipleship, hampered in my godliness, and held back in my devotion if I don't begin to grasp the glory of God? He goes on to suggest that if we do not understand and grasp the truth that God is truly glorious, we are in grave danger of misdirecting our the affection of our hearts, the ambition of our dreams, and the energy of our life. The Christian life is driven and inspired uh, in a very real sense by the God-given wisdom of this great, of his great glory. And these are my simple words, okay? Here, I, I try to get it where I can understand it, okay? In my simple words, if the focus of life is not living for the glory of the God of the Bible, we will be caught up in living for the glory of the fallen world that you and I live. That's my simple understanding here this morning. If I don't live for the glory of God, then I'm going to live for glory somewhere, but it's going to be in this fallen world this morning. Listen to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted. He was seated on, seated on a throne, throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
At the sound of their voices, the doorposts, the thresholds shook, and the temple filled with smoke. I'm going to do something different this morning. Stand with me. Please. We're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. <laughs> holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 scriptures 
Listen to David's proclamation. This is just one simple uh, example of it. Psalms uh, 24. The earth is the Lord's, everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas, he established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands, a pure heart, who does not trust in the idol or swear by the false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jehovah. Are we seeking him? Are we a generation that's seeking him? In our midst this morning, we have some younger generation. We have, I'm not sure we have, yeah, we might have a few middle-aged generation. I'm, I'm just looking to see what we've got. For, we have a lot of senior generation, and we have a lot of senior plus generation. Are we seeking God in our generation? Are you seeking God? Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. The king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift him up, you ancient doors. The king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? He's the Lord almighty. He is the king of glory. Is he? Yeah. God's glory speaks of his worth, his beauty, his perfect character, his holiness, his power. In the Old Testament, when the people of Israel traveled from Egypt to the promised land, God's glory was displayed as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Listen to Exodus chapter 24, verses 15 to 18. It says, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountains. Then Moses entered the cloud as he is, or as he went on up the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. A little, little, little bit later the people of Israel sinned greatly. By worshiping a golden calf. And Moses requests that God display his glory to him. He wanted to see God in all of his beauty. In all of his glory. Again, Exodus 33, 18 says, Moses said, please show me your glory. The Lord put Moses in the cleft of a rock and said, and said he, God, would pass by. But it's interesting. It says, then I will take away my hand. You shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. God was protecting him from his full glory. A writer goes on and says, Moses knew that seeing and experiencing the glory of God would be a majestic and awe-inspiring thing. And that is what he longed for. And that is what he asked for. And quite incredibly, the Lord said, that he would make his he would that he would make his character and identity to Moses and the people in a very special way. He would show them his goodness. He would proclaim his name, have mercy on the sinners, and show compassion on the needy, and they would see the wonder of who he is. But a full, unfiltered display of glory. Would have been too much for Moses. Or any of us. Remember the words of the prophet Isaiah. As he saw the powerful manifestation of God's presence. Woe is me. For I'm lost. For I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. The Lord of hosts. May the Lord give us a fresh vision of his glory. And I am sure this morning, the moment we see it, we will cry out, woe is me. Why does the scripture tell us 
that when Jesus returns, we will fall on our face to worship him. Every knee may bow. Yeah. Every knee will bow. I just want to make sure you know your word. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is God. Oh, let's do it now. Let's do it today. Confess he's God. A second truth this morning is Jesus reveals God's glory. In the Old Testament, God's glory is revealed, but he is unapproachable. Moses went into the clouds on the mountains, but the Israelites, they couldn't even touch the mountain. But Moses was invited into the presence of God that was represented by the clouds, but the people, you and I, weren't even able to touch the mountain. He was unapproachable. That glory of God was unapproachable. But in the New Testament, something radical takes place. John's gospel puts it this way. And the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from, from the father full of grace and truth. Later, when Jesus performed his first miracle in changing water into wine, Jesus himself said these words, or, or, or John said this about Jesus. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Think with me for just a moment, okay? On the Mount of Olives, the cloud hovers over it. Moses goes into the presence of God. But you and I, the common people, are afraid. In fact, we can't even get close to the mountain because we'll die in the presence of God. <laughs> Jesus comes, revealing the glory of God, and there's this woman destitute. She's tried everything. And she just says, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made completely whole. <coughs> Jesus revealing the glory of God and humanity able to reach out and touch that glory. Again, Jesus said in John chapter 12, I think I've given you these, haven't I, John chapter 12? Jesus replied, this is happening. Uh, uh, this is what Jesus himself says about the glory. Jesus replied, the hours come for the man of son to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also must go. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save them from this hour. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The full, God's full glory was shown upon the cross. What a place to show his glory. But his full glory was shown upon the cross. Our writer says, it is worth pausing for a moment to take this in. And let's do that. 
Think for a minute. Jesus hanging on the cross. Revealing the glory of God. Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Well, Scripture tells us that it's a stumbling block and it's foolishness. It's a stumbling block to the Jew. It's a foolishness to the Gentile, you and I, that God would reveal his glory on a cross. So it is worth pausing for a moment. God is glorious, radiant in power, and majesty, and holiness, and goodness. He is so glorious that Moses could not look on him without being destroyed. But in Jesus, through the miracle of the incarnation, we can now see the glory of God. We have seen his glory in the miracles he performed, on the words that he spoke, but his revelation of glory reached its pinnacle at the very moment when God the Son died in agony and humility for the sin of you and I. What does this say about our glorious God? His character, his nature. If that is the moment of the revelation of the glory of God, what kind of a God is this? If the ugliness, the agony, and the shame of the cross is the glory of the all-glorious God, then who is this God that we worship and this Lord that we adore? Well, he is the God of mercy. Hallelujah. He's the God of compassion this morning. He's the God of grace and justice today. He's the God of love untold, of grace unfathomable. He is the God whose glory it is to die for his rebellious, lost, and hopeless creature, you and I. He is the God whose radiant glory is revealed as he gave his one and only son to die for you and for me this morning. No wonder. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our songs shall rise. Our purpose of life is bringing glory to the God that created us. If you're bringing glory to him this morning, you're doing what you're supposed to do. If you're not bringing glory to him this morning, then my dear friend, this morning you're missing out on why you exist today. Psalms 96 says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And again in Psalms 108, it says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. 
For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And we can just keep going and going. Psalms 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness this morning. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, or Catechism, 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 has this famous summary of faith and expresses this particularly well. The Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? Or put it in today's language, what is the main purpose of humanity? The chief end of man, the Catechism says, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Hallelujah. Wow. Here's another truth. The world itself exists to bring God glory. Here in Canada, we've just experienced a once in a lifetime, for most of us, a full a solar eclipse. Oh, I know it was cloudy the day we all tried to look at it, or, or some of us tried to look at it, where the earth blocks the sun for just a few moments. And those of you that were out in, in that, and all of a sudden it got dark and you just felt even the temperature drop, eh? And the, I have spoken to people who have said that in those in those matter of just a few minutes, they they sensed like a holy hush or like just a uh, just a uh, an emotional time within that event in in just those few minutes that that happened. Could it be? Oh yeah, it is. That we experienced a touch of the glory of creation. I heard not too long after that, some famous news broadcaster said it was a problem of climate change. <laughs> I'm not sure she still has her job, but uh, anyway. <laughs> God reveals his glory through nature itself. You walk outside today, the little buds on the trees are just popping. Like, give us two or three of days of good warmth and they'll just explode. Eh? The little tulips. The little daffodils that have pushed up through the snow. And, and they're proclaiming the glory of God. Our writer says, despite what we may think, the universe is not all about us. <laughs> to recognize this is kind of humbling. But it is also wholesome and good because once we grasp it, it leads to true joy. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. We are made for God. Nothing other than him will bring satisfaction to life. <coughs> we all worship something in life. It may be money and things. If we do, we will never have enough of it. It may be our physical body, our beauty, our youth, our, uh, our young age, whatever it may be. You'll always fall short because there will always be somebody that's more beautiful than you are in the eyes of man. You may think that you have power. You may worship power. But again, you'll come up against someone that's more powerful than you. We may worship intellect. But at the end of the day, there's somebody, even your stinking phone is smarter than you are. <laughs> Here's the last truth. Worship his glory now.
prepares us for a heaven of glory. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I'm nearer home mm -hmm. than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm closer to God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 and 20 to 27 reads like this. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it the light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Wow, think of those words. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. That's all the power we've been talking about. Only one day, on one day, on no day, on no day, will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is my name written there? That's the most important truth this morning. The God of the Bible is a glorious God. And may we not only know that in our heads today, but may we experience it in our heart and life as we prepare for his glory and his splendor for eternity. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing the first part of that. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the